The first article that we're reading for this class is Kant's uh, An Answer to the Question, What is Enlightenment? And in this lecture, we'll talk about why we're starting with this article, uh, talk a bit about Kant's political context, and then talk a bit about drawing parallels to modernity. So we're starting with this article because it gives us a good sort of picture of uh, what kind of person Kant is, like what his approach to political philosophy is. It gives us a bit of insight into the guy uh, behind uh, what we're going to read, and we also get his views about some sort of particular points of politics. So he sort of talks about how the state should be run, and so we get to see political uh, his political philosophy in action. This is one of his relatively earlier uh, pieces, so uh, we'll look a little bit at the development of his thought over time, and so this is him near the beginning of the stuff that we're going to be reading. And uh, one of the things that comes out a little bit in this article is the context in which Kant is writing. So if you want context for this piece specifically, uh, in our book we have the editor's introduction, which gives us some context for uh, the piece. But in terms of getting some context for Kant's life and what's going on, so he lived his life in uh, what was then Prussia, which no longer exists, and he was in uh, the city of Königsberg, which has been renamed because now it's in Russia, but you notice uh, it's signed Königsberg in Prussia, 30th September 1784, and uh, for much of his life he lived under Frederick II, or Frederick the Great, and uh, Frederick comes up in this article. So Kant is pretty uh, praiseworthy towards Frederick in this article, and that's something he sort of kept up throughout most of his writing. It's not entirely clear whether Kant was actually as happy with Frederick as he writes that he is, so here he has a lot of praise for Frederick. Uh, whether or not Kant actually praised Frederick, or whether this is stuff that he said because he wanted to be in the good graces of the guy who was in charge of Prussia, uh, is a little harder to tell. So Frederick the Great was a uh, benevolent, benevolent absolutist, so he was the king of Prussia, he was in charge of everything, and he wanted to be a sort of good ruler who uh, sort of ruled over his subjects in a way that was best for them, so he took himself to be uh, sort of doing this for the good of the people and the good of Prussia, but uh, nevertheless he was sort of an absolutist, he was in charge of everything, he was the king, he was the monarch, and so we see a bit about uh, Kant's orientation, or at least his professed orientation, towards this kind of absolutism. And uh, one thing which you see a lot of in uh, this article is that Kant is really against any sort of uh, censorship and against any sort of uh, political rulers cracking down on freedom. And this is one reason to think that maybe he actually was a big fan of Frederick, because as he points out in this article, Frederick was not very big on censorship, especially religious censorship, which uh, Kant uh, will point out as sort of the central kind that's relevant. Uh, Frederick, perhaps to his credit, sort of did not censor things as much as many other states at that time did. When Frederick died and somebody else took over, eventually Kant did uh, get in trouble with the censors for his religious writings. Uh, he was banned from writing about religion or publishing about religion at all in Prussia at one point in his life later on. So uh, that's a sort of interesting fact to keep in mind when you think about uh, here long before, many years before this happens, what he's saying about censorship and what eventually happens. Uh, and then aside from that, there's not a lot of sort of political context to keep in mind or even uh, just general context for what's going on with Kant. He's writing in the Age of Enlightenment, which is what this essay is all about. He's writing in the Age of Empire, and we're going to see a lot of his thoughts on empire later on. Uh, he's writing in the Age of Revolution. The French Revolution will happen near the end of his life, and he'll have lots of things to say about that and other sorts of revolutions. Uh, but these will come up as we read about them. That's, like I said, that's all the context I think we're really going to go into in this course, at least at the outset. And uh, the final point in this lecture is that uh, for a political philosophy class, I think 
uh, which is entirely focused on somebody from hundreds of years ago, I think there's quite a bit you can do to sort of draw parallels between many things Kant is saying and what's going on right now in uh, your lives, in your state. So it shouldn't be too hard, even in this very first reading, but then as we get into some of the more detailed readings, I think it should not be hard at all to draw parallels between uh, what Kant is talking about and what is at issue uh, in the moment. And so the reading quizzes don't do that. I'm not going to draw parallels for you. Uh, how much I talk about parallels in class will depend on how much people are interested in. But uh, unlike some philosophy, which is sometimes hard to relate directly to your lives, I think it should be really, really easy uh, when it comes to almost everything Kant is talking about to draw direct parallels to just, you know, take the newspaper and you can find something on the front page that'll be relevant to what Kant is talking about. So this is just at the outset of the class to encourage you to maybe do that. You don't have to. You can spend your whole time sort of buried hundreds of years ago and just hyper-focused on Kant. That's fine. Uh, but it should be pretty easy to sort of start drawing links, and I encourage you to do that because often that helps you develop your thoughts about these matters. So.